What I want to do very quickly is to take you through, first of all, um, I want to remind you of the current unfairness of the system, which we talked about last year, the Leicestershire model, which is the proposal we put forward um, to put things right, and, and, a very, and then briefly run through where the national review is going and the risks are and where, where we stand at the moment. So, last year, if you remember, we demonstrated there was a wide variation in funding levels. Um, we did an analysis of the cu current system to show how there was no correlation at all between the uh, level of funding counties got or any count council gets and the cost drivers. So there's no relation between actual need and, and the money you get. Um, and we also um, went through the an analysis of council tax uh, the reserve service levels, um, and they all show a picture of unfairness. And of course, the system that we have at the moment is so complicated, no one understands it. Now, that table there um, shows the core spending power per head. Now, core spending power is, is a combination, essentially, of council tax um, and, um, and, and the government grant. The government grant's, of course, coming from the business rates. Sitting at the very top, and this is, council, this is core spending power per head, are, are, are nine out of the ten top authorities best funded are London councils, inner London councils, with Camden sitting at the top there with £1,171 per head of the population. Down at the bottom, and right at the very bottom, is Windsor and Maidenhead uh, with 612 and Leicestershire is, is four places above them. We've got a, a princely 653. Quite a number of other um, counties are, are in that group as well. But not only counties, but some of the uh, um, unitaries are in that, that group too. So there is this massive, almost a two-to-one ratio between the best funded in the country and the worst funded. If I can just show you that. Now, that's quite a complicated chart. But what we're showing there is the relationship between the, the core spending power per head and the income deprivation. Now, it, what you would expect is that if you've got a high degree of um, income deprivation, you get, uh, you get high funding. And if you actually look at it, places like Haringey and Tower Hamlets um, are, are actually near the top. But why is Birmingham and Leicester, which is down, down at the bottom there, uh, getting so little? when their deprivation is very, very similar to those London councils. And why is, for example, um, Richmond and, 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 and uh, uh, up on Thames uh, getting so much um, when they have so little de deprivation? You'd expect them to be down the bottom right-hand corner. And you get this random picture, no matter what indicators you look at. So if, I, if we do the next one, which is the... CSP per head compared to the proportion of the population um, aged over 65, and by the way, that's a key cost driver for adult care, then you see a very, very similar pattern there where the, 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 the county is tending to have a greater proportion of people over 65, um, and the London Council's having a, a smaller number of people under 65, a smaller proportion, yet still, get, still very high funded. So, there, so it's, there's no relationship there. We looked at 100 different indicators, um, and we could not find um, a reasonable co correlation. In fact, out of the 100, something like less than 10% showed any sort of statistical correlation at all. So anyone that makes the assertion that the present system is actually uh, related to, to need is actually plain wrong. Now, when we look at the council tax... There's the council tax um, changes over time. We're going all the way back to 2012 through to 2017. And you can see in the last year or so, council tax levels have, have jumped, mainly because we've put this extra amount of money in for social care. Right at the top are the council, average council tax levels for uh, counties, and the counties around about 1,600. But down at the bottom there, you've got these London councils who's actually at one point their, their council tax uh, was decreasing and, and there's over a 300 pounds um, difference between the average London council and, and the average county council. 
with the unitaries and uh, slipping in just behind the county councils. And what is disturbing is that you get a, a guy like this, uh, Mr. Cara, from the National Audit Commission, who stands up in front of a, a meeting and declares that the, count, the counties have, have got lower council tax than, 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 the, than the cities and, 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 and London. And that is just plain wrong. So we're up against people who are in key positions um, in, in, and associated with government actually making clearly wrong statements. There's a battle going on here for certain group, groups of people trying to hang on to what they've got and, and, and opposing the fair funding arrangements that we want to introduce. It's an incomprehensible system. Top-ups, tariffs, 8 to 20 rules, new homes bonus um, and damping, the whole thing is in absolute chaos. What the Leicestershire model will do, and I won't go through the detail of that because you're all being given a copy of the technical report which explains exactly how it works. And uh, uh, if, if you don't feel like reading it yourself, give it to your treasurers and I'm sure they'll go through it and explain it to you. Um, what this system does is rebase and allocate funding in a fairer way based on, on, a, on a small number of cost drivers. So we're producing something which is fair, it's going to be simple, and it's going to be transparent. And it will reallocate resources based on that need from the high-funded high councils who don't need the money to the rest of the country, and in particular counties. And all our, mat our material, by the way, that we have produced is, is open source. So let me now, 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 now go to where, where we are this one year on. We've developed the model further um, so that we can break out the district council funding from the county council funding. There was one criticism that was made of us that we didn't exemplify the districts. We've, we've actually already done that and run the model, and we're discussing with, um, with, with, the, um, with, with, with a number of district councils just exactly how it should be tweaked in order to produce something sensible for districts. One of the things is that we find that the need in a district is, is very, very different to that in a, in a county. The proportion of their... Um, of, of their uh, uh, administra administrative uh, purport, uh, um, uh, needs are actually very much greater, especially in small councils. So we have to make some adjustment for that. But we'll, we, we, we will do that in the next few months. We'll have that broken out. The system that we put forward can accommodate the 100% devolution of business rates. And so the next state stage we're going to do is do the calculations to show that what happens when you apply this um, what happens to the tariffs and top-ups that, uh, that all, the, um, that, that, that all the, the councils would have. Some of the councils will find that there are quite swinging uh, tariffs that they have to pay because in, 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 some, in some councils they, get, they can get almost billions of pounds worth of, of business rates coming in. Other, other councils, they get hardly any at all. And so there's got to be some redistribution around the country. The theory of the council tax system, when all said and done, that came in in 1991 was that if you paid more or less the same level of council tax in any part of the country, you would get something like a more or less equivalence of service. Uh, that's not the case at the moment. Now, we're also working, um, working on how the, uh, with the government um, to see how the, this would work. So we'll, we'll advise them on how to do that. We've updated the technical report um, we've spoken to quite a number of authorities, quite a few in, in the room today, and also a number of MPs to make the point to government, and we're lobbying wherever we can get to talk to people. So, there we are, I'm out, outside 10 Downing Street. Um, I got Joe uh, Moore with me who came to, uh, to speak last year, and the guy on the left is uh, Neil O'Brien, who is an MP for Harborough, and he used to be one of the special policy advisors to Theresa May, and before that to George Osborne. So he knows all the key figures, and he got us a meeting with the Prime Minister's policy advisors. So we've taken them through the model, and have to say that we got a very warm uh, reception from them. And the same thing, by the way, we went round the corner and we did the same thing at the Treasury. So where do we go now? 
if you ca if we carry on as, as with what the DCLG appear to be uh, planning, is that we won't get any change until 2021. Well, that's going to be too late for many. We know that m many councils are getting very near the, br the, the, the brink. They're using up their reserves. And uh, we think a number of councils will fall over long before 2021. So you can't wait that long. So the present system that... Uh, that the DCLG, what they appear to want to do is to continue to prop up the present system by rebasing it, put fresh data in, uh, but it won't actually deliver. If they do that, it still won't deliver a fair funding, and, it, and eventually it will start to creep back and we'll be back where we, are, where we were. So although there may be some short-term benefits from what they're proposing, we won't get the, the, a decent result. There are the, the local government association um, I've got this view that um, there should be a no worse off policy. Um, I think that's a little bit misguided. Um, if we were all funded, by the way, at the same level as Camden, the £1,171 per head, um, it would, the total amount of money needed in local government would exceed uh, six, uh, £60 billion. Um, currently, there's 43 billion going in, so you'd have to put that 20 billion into the system. Well, clearly, that's impossible. Even if you fund only at uh, at a, at a thousand pounds uh, per head, multiply that by the way with by the population of England, 54 million, that that gives you 54 billion pounds compared with the 43. So even that's 11 billion pounds too much. Uh, uh, so the LGA's position, I'm afraid, isn't isn't going to work. I put down on the bottom of the slide there about Animal Farm. If you remember George Orwell's no novel where the, the, the farm animals took over the, the, the farm and Mr. Williams was thrown out and Napoleon came in, one of the pigs, and took over. Um, and it didn't take very long before everything was much the same as it was before. And although all the names of things had all been changed. Effectively, this is what would happen if we continue with the old, the old system. So my conclusion is this, um, the counties are under the greatest pressure, many of the, are always at the cliff edge or worse. Um, the CCN, uh, thank goodness, is, is, is maintaining the pressure on the government and we're absolutely spot on to do that. Locally though, we've got to continue to lobby our MPs and ministers because there's a tremendous inertia in, in government circles and they're not keen to make a change at all but we have to win that, win the battle. And there is a good alternative. The Leicestershire model will work. Incidentally, so will the ALOT system, which uh, uh, we'll hear about in, I suppose, in a, in a few minutes' time. But the government system that they have at the moment just will not work. And this is what's going to happen if, if we don't do it. Um, right now, we're, we're starting to find that many councils, we can't, we can't uh, afford... Uh, uh, to do road improvements, and we're reducing the help that we give to people with special education, social care needs. Um, some councils are already starting to close the children's centres. Uh, before long, there'll be less money for emergencies. Eventually, our roads uh, will start to get noticeably worse because we're not maintaining them properly. Household waste um, uh, sites will start to close because we're cutting back on those. Eventually, the whole thing spirals down that by 2021-22, we'll get service failure in, children, uh, in adults and children's social care. There'll be a shortage of school places and there'll be a significant increase in antisocial behaviour. Now, clearly, that's not going to be acceptable to anybody. And so the system must change and it must change now. It could change next year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Byron, very enlightening. Uh, and now over to Rob. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, good morning, everyone. How, how very nice to see you all. And thank you, uh, Nick, to CCM for inviting me. Um, uh, there, there's no question, so, you know, as Chief Executive of SIPFA, I, I hope I'm viewed as being independent to, um, to this debate, and I think from an independent perspective, there's no question that counties 
uh, have, a, have an unfair deal in terms of resources. I, um, some of this, um, you'll like what I say at the beginning, but maybe not, don't get too excited by the end of the sentence. Um, I think you are unfairly uh, treated by the present distribution system. If I look at councils that are facing pressures, both in terms of the way that the distribution system works, but also, of course, by the nature of the fact that you bear adult services and children's services, which are the two greatest pressures on local government, and you don't have many of the services which uh, other, other councils are able to cut dispro disproportionately higher than that. So I think it is fair to say that counties are, um, you know, facing the greatest pressures of local government. And I'd say counties and some, some unitaries uh, fit into that. And I'd also say Councillor Rhodes Byron has shown me the, the approach that Leicester, uh, Leicestershire have uh, proposed, and it is methodologically sound. I, I, can, I can see the arguments for uh, a different set of cost drivers, rebasing and redistributing according to, to cost. So, uh, I, you know, I hope you like that I've said that. I do genuinely think um, it, it's true. And it is also true um, that, you know, the local government system is notoriously difficult to understand. It's rather like Palmerston, isn't it? And his famous quote about Schleswig-Holstein, which was held by the Danish king, but as a duke, uh, giving sovereignty to the German emperor. And nobody could quite understand the relationship. Uh, and he said only three people uh, ever understood the problems. Palmerston said, uh, Prince Albert, who's dead, a German professor who's gone mad, and myself, and I've forgotten. Um, and and it, is a, it, is a, it is a wonderful quote. Local government uh, finance is the, 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 the current equivalent of uh, Schleswig-Holstein. My advice, though, I'm afraid, is that I, I think it unlikely that fair funding will be materially reformed in this parliament. I think this is a government with a, a minority government, um, with Brexit taking up all of its bandwidth, and I think that anything controversial which involves winners and losers is unlikely to happen over the lifetime of this parliament. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say that, but I do genuinely believe it's the truth. And I, I think, of course, the government will go through the process of reviewing fair funding because it needs to be seen to do something but do I genuinely, hand on heart, think that it will reform the system in this parliament? Good luck, but, but, but I doubt it, in all honesty. And so I think, in, under those circumstances, my advice would be that you probably have to build alliances and you have to address some of the other issues which are facing the sector and facing the public sector in order that it isn't a straight fair funding you know, needs to happen because the counties are, are um, unfairly treated, which I, I do think is the case, because I think there are other things which are higher up on the government's agenda. Now, I'm not going to suggest for a moment that thinking about these things necessarily makes it easier to um, get finance reformed, because I think the government is going to struggle to do anything. But I would like to say a couple of words about what I think the biggest issues that the government are grappling with, and then I, my question to you would be, does the argument around fair funding address any of those, these other issues? Uh, where does it address them and where doesn't it address them in order that you may have some greater chances of, of success? So, um, you know, my, my advice is, there will not be any new reform this parliament. There will be extensions of existing reform. But I think that does mean that there, there, you know, there will be more rate retention pilots. There will be other work taking place. But I don't think there will be new material reform. What are the two biggest domestic issues the government is grappling with? Uh, clearly, housing supply and health. Uh, on health, Britain spends relatively little on health compared to other advanced economies. We spend 8.4% of GDP on health because we have a, uh, 
a nationalised system, free at the point of use, paid for out of taxation. Countries like France or Germany spend more than our 8%. They spend 10, 11, 12% of their economy on health. Uh, the United States of America spends 18% of GDP on health. What do fair funding proposals mean about the ability of the sector to integrate health? Uh, health, health is going to be a key determinant, a key domestic issue for this government. And at times, I think um, if, if SIPFA straddles the two sectors, the majority of finance directors in both the NHS and health are, sorry, both the NHS and local government are, are, are our members. Actually, when we bring finance directors together from the two sectors, it's, it's remarkable the extent to which they're ships that pass in the night. And it usually takes about an hour of sort of arguing at first, if I can be completely honest. It's sort of one side says to the other, you lot don't know how to manage your budget. If we could manage your budget, we'd do a better job than you do. And then the NHS reply, well, it's all right for you. You just close libraries. You don't close A&E departments. And generally, we sort of argue for about an hour, and then we start to talk about what can the two sectors do with each other to make it work. My, my advice is that at times, local government comes across to the health sector as thinking that spending on the NHS is theft from local government, and that it's somehow not fair that they have flat cash and you've been cut by 40%. And I think that actually... You need, the more that the sector can demonstrate working with health and making integration effective, the more your arguments will be strengthened about receiving fairer funding in order to accelerate that in integration. Now, I think STPs and accountable care organisations are a very flawed process. Uh, I chair a large STP in London, and, and I'm, uh, you know, it's really difficult, and it's not, they're not set up in a way that necessarily makes it easy for local government. But what is the government trying to achieve and would fair funding help them to accelerate it? On the whole, the government wants to move towards a model of accountable care systems. So if you go to the States, you know, a chief executive of a hospital will say to you, we used to be funded on the number of diabetic amputations we made. The insurer then said to us, we will only fund you on the reduction in diabetic amputations you make. So I had to cut the number of amputations and that was the only way I could get paid. Therefore, we went out, we worked with municipalities, we worked with the voluntary sector and we created diabetes programs in the community in order that we would get paid more. And accountable care systems intend to replace payment by results, the sort of outputs measure of, of you get paid for an elective uh, treatment by an outcome-based accountable care system. There is an opportunity for local government because the outcomes will only be achieved by things like public health and social care and better housing and many of the levers which local government holds. So I would suggest that fair funding ought to be put in the context of how would it accelerate integration if it's going to have more chances of um, the government wishing to uh, see it happen. Um, just a couple of more points and then um, I'll, I'll gladly finish um, and take, take some questions and hear other points. The other thing, of course, is um, there's, a, there's a real tension for local government and it's this. Um, Ten years ago, 15 years ago, the Treasury didn't think that local government could help to regenerate an area, uh, the, the economy or could lead to higher growth. In other words, they thought that if you regenerate your area and get business growing, it's at the expense of another area and that UK PLC was no better off. And on the whole, they saw local authority work in growth as displacement from one part, from one geographic area to another that didn't add to the economy overall. That, that view has fundamentally changed in the last 10 to 15 years. It's the biggest shift in Treasury thinking uh, that I've seen in my lifetime. And there is a view that if you can regenerate your areas, then actually that adds to the UK PLC. However, there's a tension here, isn't there? Because if local government of the future is going to be more driven 
around your role in achieving growth through skills, housing, you know, coordinating the levers of growth in your area, how does that fit with the Victorian footprints on which local government is very often organised? I used to be a London Borough Chief Executive. I was Chief Executive of London, of uh, London Borough Barking and Dagnum. When the borough was formed 50 years ago, we fostered all children, we put children into care, we had children in home within our borough boundary. It represented the economic footprint of children's social care. Of course, it doesn't now. Most of the children are in Kent or Essex. So there is this tension that local government has argued it has a role in growth, and that increasingly makes our footprints look uh, that they don't match the services that we provide or the role that we see for ourselves. And again, I, I'm, I'm, my only advice is, while the government sees quite asymmetrical models, which it's encouraging through pilots, it doesn't actually necessarily think that the sector is making an argument about its own organisation in order to operate more efficiently. And I know that you can't put this right on your own, but do I think an argument about fair funding will work? without the sector also making arguments about its own efficiency, its organisation, and how it can operate on economic footprints that better represent the roles that it has, then I don't necessarily think that gov government will listen to a straight fair funding argument on its own. And then, um, and this really is sort of teaching mum to suck eggs, I'm, I'm sorry to state the obvious, Service failure will not assist the sector in the, in the coming months or years. Uh, I, on the whole, think that the sector is better managed since the Audit Commission was abolished and to some extent deregulation led to innovation and greater political uh, choice or prioritisation locally than one blueprint. But... If one part of the sector fails or if some councils fail, I fear it will affect everybody. Uh, and you, know, you can look at an example like that with the government's recent decisions to tighten up investment regulations because the majority of councils have made commercial decisions about borrowing for pure yield for commercial purposes quite well. Some councils have made some quite risky decisions and therefore the government has tightened up investment regulations not to be able to borrow for yield outside your borough boundaries for everyone. And so the arguments that Byron have just made are right in summary. I think that the, I think the counties are uniquely... Uh, harshly treated by the existing funding. It, it is damning that London boroughs haven't put up council tax when you look at the graph. How can one argue that the area is under the same pressures or the capital is under the same pressures when it hasn't needed to put council tax up? And I, I think it's a fairly damning graph. However, I think that arguments of coming up with a dis different system of distribution won't happen this parliament if there are winners and losers and the better chance for the sector is to have a view on what would reorganization look like how do we accelerate how do we accelerate integration with health and how do we think about what the future role of the sector will be and argue for a system of funding that meets those future requirements it, if it is just a straight we want a bigger share of the pie and there'll be winners and losers there are, of course, already winners and losers. It'll just be a different set of winners and losers. I, I fear those arguments won't get very far in the context of the present Parliament and Brexit. Thank you very much. OK, so um, following the uh, art, science and history of Byron and Rob, uh, Rob you've now got the karaoke. Uh, act. Uh, I'm Duncan Whitfield. I'm president of the Association of Local Authority Treasurer Societies. And I've done that for uh, getting on for a couple of years uh, now. I should, though, admit to you that in that job, I am actually the uh, Section 151 officer for Southwark, Southwark Council in London, one of those blobs up in the top left-hand <laughs> corner. But it gets worse. Um, 
in my early career, I worked for Croydon, who actually is a, a local authority within London. Seems to me very much like a county, actually. Uh, increasingly less so as deprivation creeps out of inner London and into outer London, but uh, looks like a county nonetheless. Not as much so as Richmond, who, uh, again, from uh, Byron's graphs, that was an interesting place for Richmond to be, wasn't it, compared to Leicestershire. Um, in the middle, I, I worked for 18 years for Westminster. And it's very interesting, actually, if you take out of that council tax graph, which was fascinating, wasn't it? And as Rob says, it's quite... Uh, embarrassing, almost, for London, isn't it? But if you take Westminster, Wandsworth, Kensington and Chelsea out of that average, you will see that line moving up quite sharply. Because London is a very different place. There are three parts of London. I'm sorry to have to talk to you about London here because it's a county show, isn't it? But there is the old traditional heart of London, the City of London, the Westminsters, the Camdens, the Kensington and Chelsea's, uh, places that generate wealth for the whole country. There are the outer London boroughs, which, as I say, feel actually, a, a, curiously, a lot more like counties uh, than parts of the uh, old bits of London, the uh, more deprived parts of London traditionally, the Southwarks, the Lambeths, the Islingtons, the Hackneys and uh, um, uh, uh, Newhams of the world, who are very, very different places. So even within London, you've got three different, very different species of local authorities all competing for the same national uh, resources, the, uh, a slice of that national cake. Um, so the stories across uh, London are, uh, are very different, but it's been my great privilege, actually, to work with colleagues across all of the societies, including uh, the Society of County Treasurers, and who have done some magnificent work. And it's been a great learning for me over the last couple of years, actually working with them and seeing the pressures that they, uh, they are under, that you are under, all over the country. And uh, to rattle on to leave some time for some questions, we all know that local, uh, the local government sector is in need of oxygen. It needs a good breather. It's worked its socks off, particularly over the last seven or eight years, in uh, extreme circumstances. Uh, and I think that goes for every local authority, no, none particular uh, to the country. We need also, I think, some psychotherapy um, and maybe a good massage to relieve some of the pain and aches that uh, we have, or I, I certainly do anyway. So uh, it, where, where I guess I come from in the context of this conference is that we need a new deal for the whole of local government, not just the counties. The local government finance sy system is in chaos. Uh, one of your old uh, colleagues, and now a colleague of Rob, Rob's at uh, SIP for Sean Nolan, has described untidy Britain uh, as we moved into Devo deals and... Uh, different arrangements here, there and everywhere, and it does feel very much like that. And a neat new deal is required. And in moving ahead, I personally think, and I, I'm probably more optimistic than Rob uh, about fair funding. I think fair funding is critical to us all, and I don't think um, we should let government off the hook for that. The current funding formula we know is broken. It's old, the data is out of date, it needs to change in any event, and some of it is so broken and so out of date, it has to give a different outcome and a different result. Um, and of course, the quantum is as important as the distribution. And if the quantum is wrong, no distribution, no fair funding across our sector is going to be effective. Um, some thoughts, just putting it out there. For me, business rate retention is a red herring. It doesn't matter where the, uh, where the uh, quantum comes from. Um, it's, the, it, it's the quantum itself. And clearly, uh, in a new funding arrangement, in a new deal, London generates a lot of business rates. And uh, London would no doubt like to keep those business rates. It knows it can't. It knows it has to distribute more widely. But it's, it's really what tax funds local government from a central government point of view. And I'm not sure business rates is the answer to that. Um, as we all know, and building again from Byron's graph, council tax needs to be sorted out. Uh, the whole purpose of council tax for me is now lost. Um, it clearly uh, provokes some quite conflicting behaviours across the system. And, and it seems to me now that, particularly with the adult social care precept, it's now propping up statutory services. Uh, and I'm not sure how in the medium to long term that is sustainable. Uh, so it needs sorting, and I'm afraid that's quite a radical thing 
to have to do, and, and I, I do actually uh, probably agree with Rob that the uh, government are having a real problem finding the way out of the other end of that problem. Um, fair funding must have a focus in my mind, and the ALATS working group, who has worked with DCLG and the LGA for many months, uh, and found agreement uh, on this from all over the country, all kinds of different local authorities, key cost drivers, the reason we are, we exist, the reason our whole raison d'etre uh, has to be at the heart of that formula. Simplicity and transparency transcends all the complexity of the system that we currently work with, which is uh, incomprehensible. And of course, that funding arrangement must encourage good behaviours. Um, there is a temptation, isn't it, there to reward underachievement and the problems that actually uh, arise from that underachievement. We, so we need to uh, celebrate success and have a formula, a fair funding uh, arrangement that encourages the best of behaviours across the sector. Um, why I'm probably more confident about fair funding being something more positive for us all is the fact that, uh, again, the ALAX Working Group has always recognised that there will be the need for transition. So at the moment, we are, we are riddled, aren't we, with the damping part of the formula. No, no one has understand. I, I get a lot of damping in Southwark, but quite frankly, in the context of the cuts that we've taken in grant funding, it's invisible now, but it is still a canker in the system, and the removal of damping in a new fair funding regime is essential. However, to get from where we are to where we need to be, there will need to be a transitional period. And it may well be that year one of that transitional period makes things look exactly as they currently are, but at least it gives a, uh, a roadmap, a route, to actually move uh, towards a fairer uh, means of funding over time. Um, We've mentioned five years as a group in terms of transition. I think it could take a good deal longer, actually, in reality, but uh, transition is essential. Uh, we can't say enough, can we, uh, talk enough about adult social care and the need for proper funding. Um, I guess uh, until that, that, uh, that uh, elephant in the room is uh, pushed out the door, we, whatever fair funding uh, regime we have is not going to be effective. But uh, I would put the challenge out there. Um, in terms of integration, uh, is it a significant part of the solution? I'm not sure it is, actually. I've been in local government now over 30 years, in fact, so, yeah, too long. Um, and I've been talking about integration for all of that time, and I'm still not seeing it. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the reason for that is. It's, there's a cultural difference, maybe, between local government and health. But I'm not sure integration is the solution. I do understand that collaboration, however, must be a major part of any solution moving forward. But I guess from a Section 151 point of view, what worries me most is uh, financial accountability and responsibility within any new arrangement. Who does what and is responsible for which part? And I kind of know that we, it's very difficult for a local authority to work in a pool that runs at risk of overspend because when that overspend occurs, there's nowhere to run to in your local authority to find that resource. So finally, um, for me, it's all about uh, the sector working together. Treasurers are certainly, I think, through ALATS and with the help of SIPFA, doing more and more to find uh, lowest common denominators, common views on the discussion with DCLG and the LGA, but beyond uh, finance directors, I think there's a real responsibility on our service directors to start putting together much more coordinated uh, uh, packages of data and evidence to help some support some of the financial numbers coming out. It's quite interesting in London, I think, at the moment, we've got something like a £63 million gap this year on children's social care. That's the value of it. Putting the, putting the, the the skin on the bones of what that overspend is actually all about, what type of child protection is generating that excess. It's very hard to find. So I think we do need to work harder with our director colleagues to find those data sources. Uh, leaders of councils, chief executives, uh, and through all of this, through all of the pain and giving us the way forward for the future. I know that we will all continue to innovate and change because that's what we do and that's what we're very, very good at. Um, and in conclusion, um, 
I think the ALAX work has actually shown that across different geographies and different local demands in different areas, we can still find some significant points of agreement. And I think that for government is a very powerful message to send. Uh, of course, the devil will be in the detail, uh, but that is to be uh, built from a, a stronger foundation than the one that we currently have. Uh, and finally, I guess this for me is a once in a generation opportunity to uh, carry out a fundamental review of local government finance, the formula for distributing funds around the room, the business rates retention ordeal um, is upon us. And this is a great opportunity, and as I say, probably the once in a generation opportunity for uh, a proper reform of local government finance. And I really hope that's an opportunity that won't be missed by this government. Uh, thanks. Andre gonzalez Evans, Chair, North Hampshire County Council. I'd like to just raise a point I think that uh, Duncan just raised, which was a new deal is absolutely required, a new reform, that the absolute true reform of local government finance is essential. Too many options are always around the table about how do we redistribute the pennies that we've got the pot. In reality, a complete new framework is required. We're all sitting here, we've also gone through the, the original slides earlier on today, and just earlier on this session, we had a flow chart about where we'll all be in 2021. I know that most of us in this room are at the 2021 point already. All our services are feeling those pinches. We've taken away all that low-hanging fruit, all those easy answers, all those decisions at the end of the day that yeah. said we can grab that and the public won't realise mm. what we're here for and they won't worry about the, the effects that we're taking in terms of that environment. We have to be responsible and restructure, but we have to do it. If the government wants us to deliver proper services to the people out there, we have to have not just a, a fairer funding mechanism, not just a complete restructure, it's a real funding package for those government services. It's all too easy to look at strategic planning and be bold about it and put lots of words on slides, but what really matters are the people who are out there who absolutely suffer every time the government just contracts and says, well, the cities will get this, the cities get that, and you'll have to sort it out yourselves. Mm. We absolutely need th those... Uh, testicular challenges now delivered, shall we say, from that <laughs> point of view. Someone needs to come up and absolutely boldly smack it on the table. The same way you do when you get a chocolate orange. You smack it on the table because you can't just pull it apart in pieces because someone gets a bigger share of the chocolate. You've got to bang it on the table and everyone gets an equal share. It has to be said that the growth of this community, of our, of our country, our nation, has never been correctly assessed and it hasn't been as yet got to the point, we haven't got to that point where people are falling over in the streets. But unfortunately, unless we really take a strong look at this and send the message home to the central government today and every other day, the effects will be felt in the city and, in and the effects will be felt in our capital. We've yeah. got to go further. It's got to be a fresh new deal for everyone. Yep, I think we can all agree with that. Um, gentleman in the uh, blue shirt there. My question has just been asked. Okay, questions, anybody? Yep, back left. Oh, Martin. Is it on? Yeah, right. Uh, I'd just like to challenge Rob's pessimistic view. Uh, I really do. I'm not, I think he's right in his assessment about the difficulty, but frankly, if we just sit around and say, well, it's all impossible, let's put up with it, we can guarantee we'll carry on being disadvantaged. Uh, I think what he didn't mention, of course, is that it was in the Queen's speech that the government is uh, committed to a fair funding system. They didn't have to put it there, so one must assume there is an ambition to deliver it. I think also, as we know from the Leicestershire work, that uh, it's not a, a case of counties versus cities or urban areas. It's actually everybody against uh, one part of the, the country. <laughs> so in terms of building a coalition, in terms of uh, MPs supporting a change yeah. in the system, that is presumably it is a possibility. And as the previous speaker said, um, it, it, we're not talking about tomorrow. We're talking about changing a model in three years' time, and then there will be transition. So I just, I would hope that we're not all going to just give up, uh, because we cannot defend the fact to our voters that we are being out, they, they, we're allowing them to be disadvantaged, and I think we have a duty to make a lot of noise about this. And Rob also talked about integration. Well, under the Leicestershire model, my county will get £116 million a year. A year, £116 million a year more. It is incon inconceivable that a good slice of that money wouldn't go into providing intermediate care and all the rest of it. So we could say how it could be done with a fair system. So I think you're right to be uh, 
pessimistic, but I think, uh, frankly, we shouldn't be pessimistic and we should strongly make the case, and I hope that uh, we can all do so. Very good, Martin. Have a go at that, then. Um, I suppose I'm trying to be challenging rather than pessimistic. What, what system of finance is local government asking for is, is driven by the question, what does local government think it's for? So I, I've seen God knows how many reviews of the finance system over the years, from, from Lyons to Rainsford. Uh, none of them got past Layfield 41 years ago, where Layfield said, what is the purpose of local government, and then determine how it should be funded, because by international comparison, we don't have local government, we have councils which are local institutions, alongside other local institutions of bits of the state managed locally by central government. And actually, I think that if five million Scots can determine their own education policy and determine to fund it by changing income tax or corporation tax, uh, I think so should the Mayor of Manchester or the Mayor of London or large parts of England. So I, I believe that the funding solution ultimately is that you need access to more than just council tax and business rates that local government needs to be local government and not just a local institution. The state needs to be devolved and you need to be able to fund that through plural taxation. The mayor of New York is accountable for 50% of all taxes raised from New Yorkers. The mayor of London and the 32 London boroughs are accountable for 7%. So I. I'm, I'd probably be more radical um, than anybody in truth. Mm. I, I think the problem is, what is local government asking for? What is local government saying its role should be? What is local government saying the form and function it should have? What is local government saying devolution should look like? And what additional sources of revenue is local government arguing should be devolved in order to create an English devolved state? And I think local government needs to articulate that because government isn't. And I think unless you can talk about the prize of what you think local government and its funding should look like, just saying it should be reviewed will lead nowhere, as I'm afraid happened with Lyons and Rainsford and all the other reviews. Mm. <clears throat> uh, gentlemen, uh, oh, have you got someone at the back? Because do, yeah, do, do them at the back and then you, and then we'll see what the time is. Um, I'm Simon Hennig Durham. A uh, couple of points that just to reiterate what other people have said. I do think it would be helpful, um, looking at the Leicestershire work, to say this is on behalf of everyone, not just counties, because uh, it, it's just not helpful in terms of a wider lobbying effort. Otherwise, it just gets uh, pigeonholed as well. That's what the county council network wants. And actually, if you look at your figures, it isn't just on behalf of counties. Actually, uh, so I, I think it's unhelpful to be seen as um, you know just looking at. Uh, one, uh, one area. Clearly, you've spent a huge amount of time looking at data across the whole piece. Mm. Uh, so, it, it, you know, obviously that brings about certain outcomes, but this is on behalf of, uh, obviously, uh, mm. looking at all councils. And I also found that last slide a bit unhelpful about uh, what's going to happen by which year, given that a lot of councils have had to look at a lot of those things already. Uh, so um, just, that's just, uh, you know, just, just to uh, pass that on. Uh, I do think that the last comment uh, by Rob was quite helpful as well. You know, we, we have to, it's part and parcel, I have to say, of the finance system to think about, well, actually, what do we need this for? Uh, in, in term, and because we haven't had a, uh, an answer to that, I think that's confusing the issue and, and it's one of the reasons why there hasn't been any change. I have to say the other thing which drives me mad, so I'm just going to say this, is every time people say, this is too complicated. Mm. Uh, actually, I don't find it complicated in the slightest. Uh, and the problem is, every time that's said, uh, th then it's an excuse for people not to do anything. So can I plead, a plea from me, please, to stop saying this is too complicated? Thank the, uh, Byron will explain about the Leicestershire model. And we, we have shown, we've, as, as he says, we've extrapolated the figures for the districts. We've been to see cities, and most of the cities which do require mo extra more money than us are slightly better off. The only ones that aren't better off, as far as I can make out, is London. But Byron will uh, say a few words. Yeah, I mean, the, the, model, the model actually, as, as, as you, you, you've seen and will see in the book, uh, covers every council in, in England, um, including all, all the districts. 
Um, but we haven't exemplified the districts yet. We'll, I said we will, we'll bring those out in the next month or two when we've finalised exactly how to, how to do that split. And we're discussing with a number of district treasurers about that. But taking your point about my last slide, um, that, that's the pattern, by the way, for Leicestershire. Um, we're all in this together, and at some point, Leicestershire will fall over like everybody else. Um, some people are closer to falling over th than others, and it's, it's a pattern which is, has come about depending on how quickly uh, individual councils have got on with the cost reduction programmes, um, and, uh, and also it's, it's got a lot to do with the level of reserves that we had at the start of this process, and some people will run out before others. It's, it is, without a doubt, it's a crisis which is going to manifest itself um, within the next 12 months. Um, and I think it's going to be such a national crisis that the government will actually be compelled to do something about it. Uh, what they shouldn't do, however, is just uh, throw a slug of money at it and, and try and put a sticking plaster over the problem. They need to go back and, um, and do as I've suggested and actually put the new system in. And it needs to be the simple system. Uh, uh, um, the Leicestershire model has only got 12 cost drivers. That's all it has. Um, and so you can easily work it out. You could put this in tomorrow. OK, we need to be quick. I've got th two or three. I promised the gentleman there. Then I'm going to do the lady there for, the, for, for balance. <laughs> and then we'll do you last. Leader of, uh, Hampshire. Yeah. I think the problem really we're all facing, or why we've got this problem, is that the last time any government tried a root and branch change in local government finance, we got the poll tax or the community charge. <laughs> and we all know where that led. And I think any government is going to be very reluctant to find itself in that situation. Uh, we are facing very difficult circumstances. Paul Carter started this morning by suggesting there were at least some sticking plasters, ways we can get some temporary relief in the introduction of pay-as-you-go, letting people pay for services. As counties are reduced to just providing the statutory services, if they're going to provide those add-on services, then let's see if the people are prepared to pay for them. Is that a totally useless idea or ought we to be at least thinking about those and mm. where we can adopting pilots and introducing them. In, in Hampshire we say what on earth is the point of free bus pass if there's no <laughs> bus? So we would like to charge £10 over five years, £2 a year, so that people can get some buses. He's charging us to go to the beach either. <laughs> Could I just try and triangulate maybe between the comments here and the back uh, and those and um, uh, starting with complicated. Uh, a year ago, 18 months ago, when we started talking to DCLG and the LGA through ALATS, the current four block model was untouchable. It was impenetrable, it couldn't be moved, it, it was immobile. And it was, it's quite a success, I think, that there is now a cohort within DCLG and the LGA who actually understand that it can be changed and that is actually quite a major step I think moving forward not least because that transparency and openness and understanding for our public I think is really important because we, we it is a postcode lottery almost isn't it about where where the funding is going and just having transparency right or wrong actually about where money goes and why is really really important and on the the, the, you're absolutely right. The the, the poll tax uh, issue is still in the memory of all politicians, isn't it? But if there's one lesson to learn from that, it was a a, 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 a one-shot sledgehammer, wasn't it? If you could have such a thing to crack that nut. So there was no transition. It was just in change. There was no uh, management of the change to, uh, from old to new. And if I had a single recommendation to government as it thinks about making change. It's don't do it overnight, do it gradually and do it over time. Now that may mean the benefits to some, the winners and losers that actually get softened, don't they, over time. But the big bang approach isn't going to work and it's not going to win the politics and it's not going to actually be credible to the public. And even if council tax systems changed, there is something about the need for transition from where we are to where we're going to be. But one thing's for sure, council tax as well as the formula funding actually can't continue in this, in this current form. It's just lost, uh, as I think I probably mentioned, all its purpose. And there needs to be a common understanding if it's going to play any part in local government funding at all, in, in my opinion. OK, thank you. Um, sorry, Rose Public, I'm going to give the lady the, uh, last, uh, the last question because we've, we've got to be done by 1.30. 
Council. Um, first of all, um, can I say thank you to Leicestershire because I think what they've done is give us a piece of work that we can use for lobbying. Secondly, I want to say thank you very much to Rob because Rob's given us, us some realism in this. He's told us the truth, basically, and therefore I think we need to take what Rob is saying, we need to take what Philip said from, from Respublica, and we actually need to take control of our own uh, organisations. And I think this is the, the real uh, test for the Local Government Association, to actually take hold of ourselves, all of us, from districts to Mets to the <laughs> London boroughs, and say we want one voice for local government and we want to actually get our, get our act in order so that we have a strong voice, a simple local mm. government that can actually work with central government in a much more um, <coughs> it, uh, professional way. At the moment, local government, I'm sure, is looking at us and saying, just let them get on with it. They're arguing amongst themselves and actually we can just let them get on with it. We need a strong, simple local government and I believe that's down to us through the LGA. Well, well, personally, I think I, I, I personally think the CCN does a lot better job of representing my county than the blooming LGA does. Uh, so I don't agree with that. Uh, right now, some uh, housekeeping things. Thank you for attending. Thank you for the contributions. Lunch is served uh, downstairs, and then there are four uh, workshops on, which are uh, on the on the on the board. Uh, please arrive promptly for them because we need to get everybody back in here at 3:30 for the political session uh, this afternoon. So with that, thank you very much indeed.